It's the comedy cupcake. It's the comedy cupcake. It's the comedy cupcake. It's the comedy cupcake show. Welcome to the comedy cupcake show, hosted by your favorite comedy couple, Lila Hart and Eric Abenante. It is June twenty seventh, twenty twenty, a Saturday, a beautiful Saturday here in North Hollywood. Though you wouldn't uh, know it was a Saturday based on the outsides. It just looks like every other day now. Sat- there are no weekends. There are no weekdays. It is all blending together. How you doing, baby? I am doing great. Happy Catter Day. Oh, yes. I call it Catter Day because on Twitter that's a hashtag that trends. And normally I post a picture of Cupcake on Twitter on Catter Day. Oh, or yeah. a video, like a fun video of her doing something adorable. I mean, you pretty much post a picture of Cupcake every day, but yes, especially on Catter Day. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, it is Saturday, and yeah, the weekends it's are blending together. It's my birthday's together. in 16 days, by the way. Did you know that? Yes, I knew that. I am very well aware. I have already secured multiple birthday presents. Ooh, I'm excited. The pressure is on. Got to get something you know great what, honey? for my sweet. Your present is a present enough. Oh, that's sweet. But we both know <laughs> that's not true. I need to get you multiple presents. No, you don't. I'm really, okay, you're making me sound like I'm high maintenance. I'm not. Okay. No, it's just you're that special to me, and I need Aww, to show my gratitude. That's so sweet. And also, I want to score them sweet, sweet boyfriend points. Yeah, and Ooh. maybe some birthday sex. Yep. <laughs> boyfriend. <laughs> Boyfriend points are the only things that are redeemable for sex. It's a, uh, it's great. It's so funny. So we're drinking our tea because I don't drink coffee anymore. So to start off this episode, I have a double tea bag situation going on, and I'm going to read the little message on my double tea bag. All right. First one is, life is a flow of love. Your participation is requested. Awesome. Second one is let your heart speak to others' hearts, heart to heart. Oh, that's perfect because I want to talk about you being a social um, butterfly. Yeah, this just says uh, the so <laughs> this just says the company's name, so you're not gonna get any special <laughs> special message. I thought out of your that tea one. bag had like a special message, but no. you're not drinking the Yogi tea. I would love if Yogi tea would sponsor me, so that's why I'm reading these. Awesome. So. <laughs> I, I just want to talk about how you are a social butterfly, and it's been, yes, how, ma- it's been how many days since uh, this pandemic started? 114 days, and the reason I know that is because I quit smoking weed on March 6, 2020, and not long after that is when this whole pandemic situation underwent. Why did I say underwent? You know what I'm talking about. When this pandemic started happening. So it's been 114 days that I have been at home and it has been very difficult for me because I am a social butterfly. This time last year, I was in Canada running around as a French fry with my friend who was dressed as a cheeseburger for a stampede. I'm going to have to put that picture up because it's one of the legendary <laughs> pictures. So bang. Yeah, Ed- it's great. Magic. But yeah, it's been so, it's so weird for me to not be around people. I love being around people, being around people. I like I I love that energy that I get from just being a, a social butterfly. And now the only person I'm really around is you. Ah, you sound so happy about that. But no, it is a huge transition. It's almost like, you know, uh, people who are social butterflies, it's like it's a form of, you know, ha- habit or addiction of just like this is, you know, something that they love. They love that getting that energy from people. And so it's just got to be a different um, feeling. Like even when you talk to people with masks, I've noticed it's it's very different. I didn't realize how much we rely on reading people's lips, for instance. I've, I've had to repeat myself so much because of the wearing a mask so even if you're around people with the mask it's it's not the same experience especially for someone who is social like yourself I bet yeah and I need to upgrade on my mask selection I only have a few and I'd like okay why am I even talking about that I'm not going anywhere so it's kind of pointless but speaking of masks, you know there's this debate online it's not really much of a, a debate it's just more people getting angry at other people being like wear a fucking mask you asshole <laughs> and you know I just 
this is how I feel about the mask situation. I'm going to wear a mask. I'm going to protect myself and wear a mask. I'm going to have my boyfriend wear a mask. And I'm just going to lead by example and wear a mask. I don't really feel like it's my place to yell at people online with these Twitter fingers of anger about wearing a mask. Um, speaking of which, you know, every morning I get up and I always check Twitter. I want to see what's trending on Twitter. And today North Hollywood was trending, which made my heart drop because last time North Hollywood was trending, it was because we had an active shooter on our street. So whenever I see uh, my neighborhood trending, I'm like, this can't be good. But North Hollywood was trending because um, apparently there's a new Trader Joe's, which I'm so excited about. And there was a Karen lady in there who, and that's what we call people now, Karens, um, or white ladies who do things that people don't like. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't want to wear a mask. But the best thing about me finding out about this North Hollywood thing trending was that I found out that there is a Trader Joe's. And, honey, we got to check out that Trader Joe's. Oh, we will. We will definitely. It looked way nicer than the other Trader Joe's we had been in. It's huge. But, yeah, I, I want to talk about it because I felt it was weird that people were shaming her because, I mean, yeah, she got angry, but there was obviously a, you know, a bunch, a couple of instances that before that that drove her to that point. And I'm with you on, you know, I don't really think that we should be shaming people into wearing masks. I mean, I do um, I do understand that, you know, if you're a business, you're going to have to, you know, set regulations and people are going to have to go, you know, to those regulations. But it clearly wasn't the employees that were, um, you know, getting on her. It was just like random customers. And, you know, if it, that that's I, where I think we're taking a step too far, because, you know, I remember just a year ago uh, in 29 in the faraway land of 2019, <laughs> If you if you got on anybody for their body type, you know, fat shaming, you were just a terrible person. But in reality, that's way worse for the public health and for your risk of COVID-19, you know, being being obese than, you know, not wearing a mask. It's actually it's much worse. You know, your immune system and your, you know, health, those are going to be the key factors into, you know, COVID-19 whether it really affects you or not. And so for me, I'm going to wear a mask. I wear, um, my girlfriend always wears a mask. We're pretty diligent about that, but I'm not going to get on anybody. You know, uh, I actually saw uh, when we went into Sprouts, I saw this nurse and she wasn't wearing a mask. And then she, you could see the moment where she's like, oh, my God, I, rem I forgot it. And then she like ran back to her car. But imagine if someone's like a bunch of people were screaming at her. Where's your mask? I mean, she would she would probably be angry and it maybe entrenched in her position maybe then she would like be contrarian and be like oh well i don't need to wear a mask and i think that's a big aspect of it is people you and know people are just people are so angry right now and it just this this I, there's just so much anger online so many people writing if you feel this way and you don't agree with me unfollow me now if you're not wearing a mask you're an asshole and it's just like uh, so much so much name calling out there. Yeah, I think the main thing is like, you know, me and Lila, we have our opinions, but I don't think either one of us thinks we know better than doctors and medical opinions. And even doctors, if you read what they're saying, it's, there's a lot of conflicting evidence. They aren't really sure yet. They're still going through a lot of studies and trials trying to figure out what is the best solutions for all this. And so I think this there's just a weird trend of, people going out and like acting like they know better than one another i i think the most uncommon phrase used right now is i don't know and i don't know is actually a very important phrase. <laughs> i think the, the funniest part about about this eric is i see posts on twitter where people are shaming other people and then underneath that is here's the suicide hotline number and it's like <laughs> so you're you're shaming people and what I mean by that is it's, it's just kind of funny how we're shaming these people and it's like, okay, what do we, what is the overall goal? Because if this person comes out and apologizes and says, I'm sorry, it's still never enough. And then, then what if that person goes out and kills himself because now they become viral over this one moment in time? It's like, we've all had moments in time where I've lost my cool I've acted crazy and just imagine if that moment was filmed and captured and then went viral on Twitter or Instagram for the whole world to see 
it's just I don't know it's a it's a weird time that we're living in where we're you know we're telling people oh, here's the suicide hotline number and protect your mental health and then also I'm gonna shame anybody who I see doing anything remotely wrong and I'm gonna put it on Twitter in hopes that it goes viral because a lot of the times these people who are putting these posts on Twitter they do want to go viral you know we're very obsessed as a society for that viral tweet and that viral fame and even if it's at the expense of hurting another person yeah, I feel like at this point, uh, America, we aren't really making any things, but our greatest export is outrage. That is the number one thing we are putting out into the world right now. And yeah, it's just, it, it is remarkable. We are truly, you know, we're affecting people's mental health. Everyone is on edge because they're afraid to say and do one incorrect thing. And that, you know, the, the nerves that that must create is really harming people's mental health as much as anything. And I don't. I think what people who want change are ha having str uh, struggles grasping is that there's a lot of people who want to be on your side, but they're afraid to speak out. There's this one businessman saying, you know, I'm afraid to say the wrong thing. I'm afraid for it to be perceived the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid, you know, and I just wanted to listen, but apparently silence is violence, you know, and so. It, I, you know, he was explaining, you know, I'm doing what's best for me and my job and my family. I will try I will try and be as good of an activist and an advocate as I can. But at this point, I do feel like it is best for me to stay silent. And that's what this businessman is saying. And I guarantee you that is very reflective of a lot of people who I really, truly think would be on the side of change and activism. But they're being scared away from it. And so... Well, I think it's also funny, too, that the, the people who are so quick to outrage, they will never compliment something positive that's going on. For example, okay, I posted a picture today. Check it out on Love Lila Heart on my Instagram. This really cute picture that Eric took of me and Cupcake. I'm holding Cupcake, and it just happened. I was picking her up, and I smiled really quick. Eric got the picture instantly. And it was this picture where I'm holding Cupcake up like this. And I love the picture so much because you could see how long Cupcake is. Like, she's almost the full length of my body, but she's a small, long cat. And I posted that picture. And, of course, somebody had a comment on there and said, Oh, how could you be picking up your cat like that? How dare you? That's animal abuse. And at first, I felt like this need to explain myself and be like, no, you don't understand. It was like a quick photo, and Eric just so happened to get the picture. And then I was like, I looked at that person's page. They had no profile picture. They were they had no pictures themselves, and I just blocked them. Like, it, it's funny how this person decides to comment something um criticizing me but has never once commented anything positive that i've done but as soon as i do something that they're like oh that is animal abuse um they want to comment right away well it is funny that in 2020 you have to um explain you picking up your cat that seems to be like the most benign uh action you could do and it's not like she was you know choking or strangling her as she was picking her up it was just a very typical way to pick up your cat you know so it's it Eric was taking photos of me like, I, like we always have a photo shoot on my staircase when I'm looking real cute and cupcake had climbed up so I was like oh gra take this picture really quick I'm gonna grab her real quick and we grabbed her really quickly took the photo it was one shot and I put her down and the thing that really pissed me off the most about this guy's comment or I don't know if it was a man or a woman but their comment and today we it could be anything might have been an alien um the comment was, how many times did you have to hold your cat like that to get the perfect shot? And I'm sorry, sir. I'm very photogenic, and so is my cat. It's only one time. One <laughs> shot was all it took, okay? And, you know, I have even had comments before, too, where I'll have Cupcake. She loves this fish upstairs, our pet dino. And Cupcake is always, you know, at Dino's aquarium, and Dino will come out of his little cave, and they play together. I had somebody message me and said that I was abusing my fish by <laughs> allowing my cat to torture my fish, um, and that was like fish abuse. And it, it really made me laugh because I'm like, first of all, how do we even – it was just too much. Well, fish abuse, I'm sure they eat sushi. You know, <laughs> it's just like, it's, yeah, it's like fish abuse. You're lucky I didn't take that fish and put it in my frying pan, you know? I just <laughs> – People are so quick to judge you from just one small moment that they see. And it's like, just to go back to Cupcake really quick, when we got Cupcake three days in, 
She almost died. She had kitten pervo. The fact that she has been alive this long is a miracle in itself. So it's like for you to judge me off of picking up my cats. Like, do you have any animals, sir, sir or alien, ma'am? And do, have you rescued betta fish from Petco? Okay. Yes, I may have overdone it with the betta fish. But if I didn't have my betta fish here, these two fish would be in a little cup at Petco right now, just sitting in a cup. Mm -hmm. At least here, you know, they get to be stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, as far as Cupcake and Dino goes, we have so many videos. I, I think the last episode, we actually started off the episode by, you know, a little montage of them uh, playing together. And they, Dino and Cupcake really do play together. It's adorable. Uh, Dino the fish um, has a, you know, moss-covered log. And if Dino was truly afraid or tortured by the cat, any time that Dino saw the cat, it would cower under the log. But that's not what happens. In <laughs> fact, a lot of the times it'll kind of taunt Cupcake and, like, you know, do splashes and, like, you know, really get it, you know, re really get into, you know, a back and forth, a repartee with Cupcake. Cupcake will extend her paw on one of the sides of the um the tank so that you she can elicit you know some movement from dino and so it is it is interesting that you know people they think that they can analyze your life from the content that you've posted and think that they know better than you a lot of people online they think that the people that they're commenting on are dumb and they're looking for that gotcha moment and everyone is Sarah Palin, you know, who hasn't read a newspaper. And it is kind of exhausting because it's, you know, I think there's a lot of people who, you know, when they get when they get this kind of reaction from people on social media, it it's going to end up getting the opposite reaction than you intended out of that interaction. And so I think people are having trouble with understanding that aspect of social. Yeah, I, you know, at first I was going to comment back to this person and explain myself. But then I was like, why? It is a privilege for you to be able to look at my content. And if you're just going to criticize me, goodbye, block. I don't need you. I don't. Well, yeah, if um, if Cupcake was so, you know, afraid of you picking her up, then why did she, you know, come over to you? while you were doing My the photo, photo shoot. shoot. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I if you have these photos, I don't know if you do, but there were a bunch of photos where uh, Cupcake's in the background just watching Lila, really observing Lila during the photo shoot. If Lila was such a monster, then, you know, Cupcake would be very far away in this at this point. But, you know, Cupcake was like almost like egging Lila on. Pick me up. Pick me up. Pay attention to me. <laughs> and that, you know, that's that's a sign of a good pet owner is, you know, you give all your pets the adequate, if not, you know, more than sufficient amount of attention. And also, if Cupcake was such a monster to the fish and to all the other creatures in our house, first of all, she does not even care for the two turtles upstairs. She doesn't care for the turtles at all. The only fish that she cares about is Dino because they're they're kind of like playmates. And like Eric said, Dino comes out of his little cave and he splashes up Cupcake and he taunts her. And it's almost like it's very sweet to watch them. And I'm, um, yeah. Cupcake is not a monster because if she was, she could easily jump into the turtle tank and eat one of the turtles and she's, she could care less. Yeah. And also, um, there's a little bit of history with Cupcake and Dino the fish. I, I believe both of them were at our last apartment, right? No, they, when we lived at your parents' house for a bit, they both. Oh, well, there. you know, that's what I'm getting, that's what I'm getting at. Like they've, um, they've had more than, you know, uh, they've been at they've been together at a couple different places. They've had a, I think about a year e uh, of experience with each other at least, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so they they have a bond. I really do think, in my opinion, just from watch observing them and how they interact, I believe that Cupcake feels that Dino is her pet. Oh. <laughs> you know, she's very you know she's very lovingly like watching Dino all the time. I I hope uh, Cupcake and Dino live as long as each other so that they never have to experience, you know, one losing the other because it would be devastating. They really have a bond. That's so sweet. And Dino is an OB zebra. I don't know what an OB zebra is, but that's what 
And it was said at the pet store that I bought them at in Chatsworth. Outside the tank, it just said OB Zebra. And I wanted a fish. I asked the guy, I was like, is there a fish that gets pretty big that could just be like happy by itself? And he pointed at this fish and that's where I got Dino. Yeah, that's great. So the, that fish is the only non-beta we have, I assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's cool that, you know, Cupcake has such a affection for that that one fish. Yeah, because like, like we said, there are... Um, there's multiple tanks in the living room down here. There's multiple tanks in the bathroom, uh, Cupcake's bathroom, we like to call it. There's multiple tanks uh, on the second floor. Cupcake only cares about one tank. I mean, it's pretty, <laughs> you know, it's pretty easy to, you know, to do a scientific experiment on this. If we moved uh, Dino's tank down here, uh, we would get you know, cupcake down here more often. And surprisingly, she does not care for any of uh, my plants, which I'm very grateful for because, you know, some plants can be poisonous to your pets. But cupcake, she doesn't bite any of the plants. She doesn't eat any of the plants or even mess with them. And we have a new plant that has been added to the plant family. Oh, yes. I'm so excited. We got a Venus flytrap because it was on sale at Sprouts. <laughs> so I got it. Um... I've never had a Venus flytrap before, so I had to watch a bunch of YouTube videos to see, you know, how to take care of this new creature of mine. Because, you know, it's not just a plant. I fed it a fly the other day, like a fly that Eric caught outside. It was dead. So I don't know if you really caught it, but um, he uh, found well, a dead fly and I fed it to the Venus flytrap. Before all the 2020, you know, haters come out. Oh, Eric's torturing and killing flies. I have this bucket of water that I stick my feet in. <laughs> Um, uh, outside when it's hot, the fly drowned in it unbeknownst to me. And so Lila and I took tweezers, I took my little tweezers and then I grabbed the little fly and then I put it into the mouth of the Venus fly trap. I mean, she asked me a question I never thought she would ask me, which is, do you have any bugs for me to feed to the Venus fly trap? And I was like, no, I don't. But then I looked down and there was a dead fly. I was like, oh, I actually do. I actually, it got, was I got awesome. So, yeah, I'm loving my Venus flytrap. It's still alive. We've had it for about a week now. So. <laughs> it's still alive. We've had it for a week now. Well, yeah, uh, we'll we'll catch you guys up later on, you know, how long it lasts. Hopefully it lasts forever. I want it to. I want it I to hope last. all my plants last forever. And, you know, the funny thing is, is I have not always been like a plant enthusiast. OK, but I think this is kind of what happens naturally as you get closer to 30. You know, I'm a 28 year old lady for 16 more days. But I love plants. I love plants so much. You know, I I watch plant videos for fun. And it's just so hilarious how my um, my interests have changed over time you know yeah no i once i once had this plant that i really loved and i grew it and i took care of it and then i cut it down and i smoked it so oh my god eric so you know we all have different ways of showing love for your plants i really loved that plant so much it was great i had like a whole batch of them they were awesome my dream is for us to someday have a uh, a backyard where we can have a ton of plants that we can grow our own vegetables because I love I, I watched Desi Perkins and she calls her plants uh, per Perkins produce and so I told Eric we can call ours the heart harvest <laughs> <laughs> alliteration is key to growing plants apparently that's but I would just love and honey I'll grow your marijuana plants for you I won't smoke any of it but I'll water it you know I wow. would much rather have you smoking stuff that I grew personally I mean me too I mean as a as a Jew that's saving money it's like uh, all the things that I want in life are coming together my girlfriend growing me marijuana that'd be great speaking of which i am still i am still sober it's been almost 60 days i know it's unbelievable truly truly unbelievable to me <laughs> we still haven't got the news on lila's special uh thing yet so i'm waiting on that you know i'll get i'll get back on my green train once uh once i get uh we get the news but you know it's been uh it's been pretty liberating to find out i don't really need uh, I don't need to be in that state all the time. And, you know, I come from uh, a family history where, you know, some people in the family 
they need you know substances at certain amounts of time and so it feels like liberating to understand that oh yeah i can you know i'm pretty good with my mental health in this scenario where you know i don't have to worry about necessarily oh relying on a substance all the time so that that is nice I've i think well this has truly been a special time for us because number one we're constantly together we're both completely sober I've quit coffee for tea drinkers and, you know, we're just here with our pets. No, it's, <laughs> it's been, it's been good. Um, especially, um, the getting off of tobacco, you can see like the bags under my eyes have re uh, reduced drastically. And so, yeah, it's been, there's been a lot of physical, um, benefits to it as well. I feel like it's, um, I would highly suggest it to, uh, a lot of different people. Yeah. It's a good way to go. I think that, I think everybody once in their life should, you know, try 30 days of complete sobriety just to get a reset, you know, just to get a real uh, get in touch with yourself and to understand yourself more. It's scary being sober. So you really have to face all of your emotions. But if, if you can do 30 days, you know, I think you could do anything. Yeah, for me, my biggest fear was as a writer, you know, would it stymie my imagination? And so... For me to be able to still go into a different world and really picture, you know, a lot of different things and still have my imagination intact, that was um, the biggest obstacle to overcome for me. Well, speaking of writing, honey, I think your writing has been amazing these last couple weeks. Oh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the monologue you have for episode seven of Comedy Cupcake. Awesome. So, well, let me let me get that started. Well, honey, I am so excited for this week's monologue. Oh, yes, it's it's awesome. It's exciting. It's been fun to write these every single week. I feel like I'm getting better. Let's let's maybe uh, someday I'll have a monologue. <laughs> that would be so much fun. I would love that. All right. Let's uh, let's find out if I'm getting better. All right. I'm ready. OK, boomer. This is the rallying cry of the millennial. Millennials, born 1981 to 1996, have a disdain for the boomer generation, born 1946 to 1964. Why? Well, because the boomer generation raised the millennial generation. If my generation read books, we would know this is a tried and true pattern that is repeated every generation and will repeat when we have kids. The irony of this is we think we will be better parents than our parents. <laughs> well, we are not. Because in reality, millennials and Gen Z have done the least growing up of any generation in the history of the world. We have the most information available at our fingertips compared to any other generation, while our actions in 2020 have clearly proven that we've absorbed the least amount of information. <laughs> While the boomers spent their youth creating art that still resonates to this day, we have created memes and sent pictures of our genitals to each other. <laughs> Millennials cry about the unfair advantages of capitalism pr that pr they provide to the rich while simultaneously making fun of anyone who texts them without an iPhone. <laughs> while we cheer as statues of the Confederate generals are torn down, we cry about the election being rigged against Hillary Clinton in 2016. She won the popular vote, is the millennial version of Confederates whining. We won more battles. Yes, but in both cases, your campaigns lost the war. What my generation does not understand is although we are winning small battles during 2020, we are losing the war to the boomers who actually vote. Wow. When boomers virtue signaled to their peers back in the day, they had to do so with actions, by actually going out and virtue signaling. Millennials and Gen Z only have to type on social media to perform their virtue signaling. Actions have always spoke louder than words. So why is it my generation is the loudest with their words? Because their actions cannot back them up. Behind their words are actions that contradict their words. These virtue signalers are now MySpace angling a new reality to maximize the parts that are flattering about their past but hiding the blemishes that help paint the imperfect but realistic unfavorable reality that all of us have growth to exhibit. None of us is perfect. Absolutely. 
what is the connection between parents, boomers, and cops to millennials and Gen Z? These are the primary authority figures in their lives. Millennials and Gen Z have always had a particular problem with authority. In the 1940s, two out of 10 people surveyed thought they were very important people. In the 1990s, this number rose to six out of 10. I'm sure if we did this same study on the millennials and Gen Z in 2020, it would be as close to 10 out of 10 as, as, as it has ever been. American millennials have a particularly selfish set of issues with authority. We rail against our parents, the ones who raised us, and American cops, who happen to be the most progressive, compassionate, and racially diverse set of cops in the history of our country. Millennials have issues with authority, yet we count out a Google, Facebook, and Twitter, and Apple because we are so addicted to the internet. These companies literally control the information we receive, yet we will never challenge their authority, despite the fact that these are the companies that should be defunded, not the police that protect our rights. Oh no. <laughs> Millennials only have issues with authority figures that affect them. Xi Jinping runs a Chinese Communist Party where the CCP cops in Hong Kong are gang raping protesters. That's yes, disgusting. look it up. The CCP is committing the next Holocaust to religious groups in mainland China, where Uyghur Muslims are in concentration camps having their organs harvested, and the Falun Gong are not allowed to practice their religion. What is their religion? Breathing exercises. No one here in America is saying, I can't breathe for them. There is slave trading going on in Libya today, at this very moment. But no millennials or Gen Z here in America are upset at these racist authority figures. In Saudi Arabia, women need a male guardian's approval to get married, leave prison, or obtain health care. During World War II, the Americans did not do anything about the Holocaust until they did, because they did not have access to the information that there were concentration camps. Well, what is our excuse? The Holocaust caused by the CCP does not affect us. And as millennials, we only care about things that can affect us. People are protesting in the streets against cops, thinking their problems will erase post-pandemic. But there will always be an authority figure that angers millennials and Gen Z. American millennials are hypocritical in the criticizing of authority figures that they repudiate. We have more compassion for criminals than those who are sworn to protect us from the criminals. When a criminal on camera fights with an authority figure, takes his weapon, tries to use that weapon against the authority figure, Millennials and Gen Z cheer him on and identify with him. When a cop tries to defend themselves against that same criminal, he is deemed a murderer. Many millennials marched for the criminal. No millennials or Gen Z would dare march for the authority figure who is protecting us from the criminal. We allow the criminal to have blemishes and mistakes, but the authority figure must be perfect. This hypocrisy brings me to the Chaz. The Chaz protesters officially released their demands to the city of Seattle. What was the first demand? Remove qualified immunity for cops. Fourth demand? Amnesty for all protesters. Fifth demand? Remove all statutes related to when deadly force is justified for a cop. There is an inherent hypocrisy among the protesters. Anything they do, they should have amnesty. No questions asked. No explanation. Any force that the protesters commit is justified. In fact, any mistake a protester makes should be granted amnesty. When a cop is committing self-defense, especially in moments of saving their life by using deadly force, that is never justified to the protesters. They should be removed of their amnesty. What about the four shootings and the use of deadly force while on the chance from the protesters? No, no explanation needed. Those protesters, they deserve amnesty. You need to have more compassion for the protesters, not the authority f figures protecting the protesters, claims the people of Chaz. Protesters, while claiming they have compassion for one group and themselves, 
have no compassion for those that they are trying to change, the cops. Until they can fix this hypo hypocrisy, they will be like Hillary Clinton and the Confederacy, winning battles but losing the war. That was great, honey. Oh, thank you, baby. That was really great, minus the fact that you spilled your tea. I know. Did I scare the fish? No, it's okay. But, you know, you spilled the tea while spilling tea. Oh, wow. I didn't even see that coming. That was pretty good. You know, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that there is a lot of hypocrisy in our generation. I think a lot of people are so much virtue signaling online. You know, it's very funny to me all these tweets and all these Instagram posts, like, would you still be a political activist without Twitter and Instagram? And are you doing this because you care about people or are you doing this because you hope to go viral and to gain more fans? You know, I, it, it really makes me sad, the lack of empathy that people have for others. And uh, we're, you're allowed to make mistakes, but you're not allowed to make mistakes. You know, like <laughs> I'm allowed to make a mistake, but not you. And I always think it's funny that whenever I tell anybody that, okay, for example, I quit coffee. They're like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? And I feel like self-love is self-discipline. It's saying no to things that I know in the long run are going to hurt me. And I think our generation is filled with people who they just want, oh, life is short, YOLO, I'm going to drink, I'm going to party, I'm going to do what I want. There can be no consequences for me. Fuck the police, fuck authority. But they don't, they don't want to do things to better themselves, you know? Like there is room... For me, I feel like I've made a lot of mistakes in my past. I've made a lot of mistakes. And um, I remember one time I had done so much blow that uh, I thought I was going to kill myself. Um, I got so scared that I did call the suicide hotline. And then the freaking suicide hotline hung up on me. So I, <laughs> I feel... <laughs> I always feel some type of way when I see people sharing the suicide hotline number. I'm like, they don't really help people because I did try to kill myself one time and they hung up on me and I could have just jumped off the roof of my house. You know, thank God I didn't. But thank I think God. you're better off posting your own personal phone number and being like, hey, to my friends, I love you and I care about you. Call me. But we we want – it's very, we. do you get what I'm saying? Like, oh. it's very funny how you'll like – Throw out this number. Call this number for suicide help, but you don't want to be the one to help people. But you expect other people to be the one to do it for you. Yeah, and I think there's something that you said that I really want to touch on. I've heard this happen multiple times where Lila will tell someone on the phone that she's quitting coffee, and they will be offended at the notion that she's quitting coffee because when we do something, people feel like it's an attack on them. No, this is just what I'm doing, you know, just like the woman who wasn't, you know, wearing the mask or a variety of other things, you know, maybe this is good for me. And, you know, it doesn't have to be an attack on you, but there there is a subconscious projection that people do where they go, oh, well, I am not off coffee and uh, I, what I do is perfectly fine. I wasn't attacking what you were doing. I was saying for me, I don't I don't think I should drink coffee. You know, and part of it. Was uh, yeah, it's very funny. Like I have to like go into this thing of explaining myself. And then I almost feel like I'm not really explaining myself. I'm just comforting this person. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's, and it's happened multiple times. But I truly do believe, Eric, that self-love is self-discipline and self-mastery. And, you know, if I did everything that I wanted to do, it wouldn't necessarily be good for my body and for my health. Because believe me, I want to drink 12 cups of coffee a day. I love coffee. Yeah, but, but you're not good for me. but you're not even seventy five pounds, and so it spreads it spread through your body a little differently, you know, from what I've observed. It just hits you a little harder. Whereas tea is much more mild, and you know it has, you know, I you know there's more water, less sugar. It just it just hits you differently. You know, and and another thing too is what I said about like you should let your life be an example. Let um what you do be an example for change to help others. Like, do you know how much it warms my heart when someone messages me and sends me a picture of a betta fish that they were inspired to make a pet because they watch my Instagram stories and they didn't even think about having a betta fish. And it makes me so happy because then I think about all these betta fish at Petco that are literally just sitting in a jar and me having all my fish inspired someone to go to the store and 
give that betta fish a home so it wouldn't be sitting on a shelf in a jar. Or when somebody messages me a picture of their plants, you know, and it's like, let your life be an example. If you want people to wear a mask, you wear a mask and post yourself going out wearing a mask. Maybe more people will be inclined to wear a mask. But if I quit coffee and then I'm going around telling everybody, oh my God, you should quit coffee. It's bad for you, this and that. It's like, no, why don't I just quit coffee and then post a picture of my clear skin and people will message me and be like, hey, why does your skin look so clear? How, what are you doing? And then I can say, I haven't drank for three years. I drink a lot more water and that might inspire someone to make better choices. But it's not me going down at people and uh, trying to act like I'm above or better. Yeah, I think a big issue with 2020, especially in this generation, is just, you know, people online want you to be perfect, or if you're not perfect, go away. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no room for growth or getting better. You have to come fully formed and, you know, fully self-actualized or else... We want to send you to the Google logs. And in my opinion, you know, what I really crave these days on social media is, you know, just looking at people being vulnerable and open and honest. And yet what we constantly get is people cr trying to craft a perfect image. And I feel like there will be a swing of the pendulum to the other side where people react more favorably to people who are making mistakes who are trying who are growing but right well, now that's also very interesting too eric because it's um you know with the cancel culture we don't even when pe someone's getting canceled right and then that person comes out and apologizes the apology is not enough for the mob and it's almost like i think it's funny how the same people who are posting the suicide hotline are also canceling and criticizing people. And it's like, what if that person you canceled and criticized hung themselves or killed themselves because they could not take the anger and the hate from the mob? You know, what then? So it's just, it's a very, I just think that just be the change you hope to see in the world. You know, there's a lot in your own life that you can change and make better before you go. I really don't feel like I have room to criticize another person. You know, I'm just trying to master my own life and stay safe and love the people that I'm with and I'm around. But, you know, it, it's, it just makes me really sad that people would much rather criticize and talk badly about other people when there's a hundred things that they could look back in their own lives to fix and change and in turn be a lot happier. Yeah, and I also think that we as Americans, we are so inept and ignorant of how it is in the rest of the world. Yes, yes, that part. You know, we have, you know, we may be an imperfect system, but every other country is looking up at us trying to figure out how we can do it like us. Whereas there's a lot of, co there's a lot of people in a lot of countries who wish they could go out and protest in the streets and say, fuck our government, fuck the police. There's a lot of places where you cannot say that. And if you do say that, that was the last time you said that because they found out and they got you. And so I, I do feel like we need to have a more worldly view. We're very, you know, Americans, we think we're the best and the worst at the same time. It is kind of funny. Like we kind of we kind of know we're the best. But then we think, you know, we get angry at, you know, uh, you know, other cultures. And, you know, it's just like, for instance, you know, we've been getting into Korean movies lately. Oh, yeah. In my opinion, in the last 10 to almost 20 years, they are the kings of cinema. They're putting out original scripts. They are, they're really... And the acting is phenomenal. Yes, yes. And they're putting out stuff that, you know, is because they looked up to old Hollywood and what we used to do. But we don't do that anymore. We just kind of rehash the same old, same old... And it's gotten to the point where you have no original ideas. And to me, I, it does feel like the discourse uh, in general is getting to that point. We don't realize that, you know, the, the world is kind of catching up to us in a lot of different respects. But, you know, when it comes to freedoms, we're still the best. When it comes to the things that we think we're the best at, like, you know, art, we are actually falling behind on. Yeah. 
And I, you know, I think what, what we should really defund, honey, I think we should defund Pornhub. And where is the <laughs> outrage over sex trafficking? Wow. For real, where is that outrage? You know, the same people who are criticizing, let me see your Pornhub history. You are a sicko too. We're all sick freaks. And that's what really should be defunded is Pornhub. And I want, where's the outrage for the victims of sex trafficking? Yeah, well, I do think Pornhub in general is going to be a gigantic contributor to sex trafficking. I mean, is there even a check or a balance on if the people in the videos are, you know, of age and stuff like that? I don't think we really truly know that. There's a lot of like amateur porn, for instance, where it could easily be, you know, someone who is underage and you know, it, how are they knowing that? It's not like they're showing you their I, their ID right before they, you know, get into it. And, you know, there's a lot of different things in the culture. For instance, the wall, Trump's wall. The main reason he is doing that is to prevent sex trafficking over the border. And I feel like sometimes we get lost in political arguments and we forget about there's a lot of there's a lot of people being sex trafficked. What did you say? It was like 200 million kids go missing or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That's a, that's a, that's a lot. And so we like to get high and mighty about a lot of different things, but that's in my opinion besides the two holocausts that are going on in China, those are the key issues of our time. Is the sex trafficking that's going on right now. I mean, it it is it's definitely the most underappreciated, under talked about story in the world. No, nobody's talking about it and it's happening everywhere. So that that's where my anger is towards that that is where my anger is towards and you know what's happening in china and the fact that there is there is still slavery going on in other parts of the world you know and where's the outrage for that mm -hmm. yeah, i mean you could even argue that the chinese communist party is running an entire country of slaves they're is no constitution there are no human rights they can be changed at any time by the two leaders xi jinping and wan Shishan. and so it's just a it, it's just kind of a i feel i i kind of wish that americans were a little uh more understanding of the world at large yeah and i, I liked what you said in your monologue about defunding facebook it's like we a lot of people's political views are based on what they see on Facebook and it's being controlled. It is being controlled. You know, people don't want to wake up to that. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, I come from a democratic background. I voted for Obama twice, Bernie once, uh, we'll see with the next election, but I, you know, it is very interesting. There's a lot of stuff coming out about how, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, etc. they have a political agenda and it is for the left and they will censor people on the right. And it's making me a lot more sympathetic to people on the right because they shouldn't be silenced. If their views are so dumb and ignorant and etc., then let them speak their opinion. You know, I find it very interesting that, you know, uh, on Instagram and all these other social media sites that you know, we have to do a fact check for one side, but then the other side never gets fact checked. We never talk about how the children in cages thing was started 2014 during the Obama administration. And it's always it's always put on the you know, it, it was as soon as Trump got elected, it was put on him, even though uh, it was started by Obama. And so it's just it is interesting. We should have a, a yeah, balance of it. It's funny to me how the president can be censored on Twitter for harmful stuff, yet you can go on Twitter right now and see a dildo in someone's asshole. Like you well, can watch, you can watch porn on Twitter. You can watch someone get murdered on Twitter. But the the president tweets something, sentences, words. Oh my God, these words of hate. I can literally watch dildos going up someone's ass and throat on Twitter, but words have to be silenced. Uh, I would say another main hypocrisy is Stanford just came out with a very interesting study uh, analyzing the uh, Chinese Twitter bot army. They're called the Wu Mao army because that translates to 50 cents. 50 cents per post is what they are paid. 
and you look at you know it's a very detailed study of what they are doing and how they influence our information on coronavirus how they influence our information on hong kong tibet and taiwan and it's it is pretty interesting that twitter and facebook and you know they sure do not censor any of the things said by them and it is it is way more false than anything that the president said and the president obviously says a lot of false things but part of that is politics so if you're gonna the the pandora's box of we're gonna censor one side and their views it it you are putting your thumb on the scale and the unintended consequence is there's gonna be a lot of people who you know they they think that's unfair and they start to become sympathetic for the other side yeah and you know what i think is funny eric when i when I see anybody on my, you know, my Facebook or my Instagram and they post something like they have um, an opinion of some sort and they're like, and if you don't think the way that I think, unfriend me now. And I always find it funny when it's somebody that I really love and care about and I've been very kind to. And it makes me laugh to be like, oh, if you knew that I think the opposite of you, would all the nice things I've done and all of our history of friendship be boiled down to one difference of opinion do you really mean that do you really mean that you don't want to be friends with me and you want to unfriend me off of one different opinion we have even though we have history of friendship and history of shared happy experiences but because i have one opinion that is different than yours then i should unfriend you and close the book completely on the entire history of our friendship just makes me laugh because it's like when you when you put that out there into the world, it just really makes it seem like to me like, wow, you're really not open to having a conversation. And it's gotten to the point where if you say, oh, I'm quitting coffee, people will think it's like a political stance of some sort of like, oh, you're attacking how I feel. No, it's just <laughs> I'm doing something different, you know, and I feel that we have lost that level of discourse where you're allowing someone to do something different. You know, I sympathize with that woman who walked into Trader Joe's. Maybe she forgot her mask and then she's in the middle of shopping and then people are giving her shit. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh, well, f fuck your mask. You know, it's just like I, I, I think we have zero compassion for others. And uh, I think we should uh, we should fix that. Yeah. And, you know, you might get canceled for saying that, Eric. Yes. Well, let's uh, let's get <laughs> let, let me uh, check on the cameras, but let's get into um our list of korean movies that we really liked watching all right so before we go we are just really getting into korean movies um we've just been watching a bunch of them we've seen a little over a dozen so let's just uh let me give my top 10 of korean movies <laughs> and then you this can, is so funny and then you can tell me like up or down you know, like which ones where you would place them differently. Okay, what's your top 10? So, Go from uh, lowest to yeah. number one. So tenth, uh, number 10 was The Handmaiden. It, you know, there's a lot of cool aspects of it. The only Korean movie I've ever seen with like, you know, some lesbian themes. That was pretty hot. You know, <laughs> there's some, um, there, but you know, there's a lot of unnecessary gore in this movie. You know, not, no spoilers, but like, someone's fingers randomly get chopped off. I'm like, what? I was getting into the lesbian stuff. You know? Were you really? Are you into lesbian stuff? No, it was just, it was different because we were watching all these different Korean movies. All of a sudden, randomly, there's like a, some lesbian stuff. I was like, oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. And so, you know, it, it, it's really well shot. Uh, it's, it's one of the best, uh, best for cinematography. The setting is really ornate and nice, like a very cool old school house. I think it's like a period piece too. So there's a lot of cool aspects of it, but I don't know, a lot of unnecessary gore for me. Yeah, and okay, I don't want to give away too much of the movie, but just say spoiler alert. A spoiler alert. Um, the whole, the whole premise of the movie of the girl like reading out loud the porno books. Just, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my god, it was so funny. And then, so me and Eric watched this movie. And after the movie, I'm like, oh, let's get it on. You know, time for some sexy time. And, like, Eric was just not having it because we just watched the man get his fingers chopped off. <laughs> well, I was and like, was I having, needed. He was having a moment. I needed, like, a couple <laughs> minutes to reset my life. Because it was just like that. 
it was so random. I don't know. I was, I was, I was turned off. on. I was like, I'm ready to go. I just <laughs> saw this man's fingers get chopped off. Let's bone. <laughs> uh, let's do it now. <sighs> Eric was like, he was having a moment. I needed, I needed the proverbial cigarette. I was like, I need to just relax, get into a new state of mind. But it, it was pretty cool. Like uh, again, one of the okay, more beautiful next ones. Movie. It was not a, okay. First of all, no, the okay. Vi- cinematography. The cinematography was great. I don't really, ne- I don't recommend people watching it. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, it was it was the tenth best. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, number nine, uh, the witch. What I, it, it's like Korean The Matrix. If Neo was a chick. Oh, that one was so good. I can't believe it's number nine for you. That should be like number three. It was really good. I just, you know, I. There's a part two coming out 2020. For me, there's. One of the best twists you'll ever see in a movie. So good. But so it, good. It took me a while to get to the twist. Let's, let's just put it that way. Like, there's a, there's a clear first half and a second half of the movie. The Eric, second half mean goes... it took you a while to get to the twist? That's the point. Well, it's just okay, more... You're slow. I felt like the first half was just not nearly at the the fun and uh, rewardable pace that the second half was. Second it was half a was great, great movie. I don't agree with the number nine spot. Okay, keep this going. All I right. have to pee. Along with the gods, and number eight, this one. Are you serious? That should be number two. It is really fun. It might be the most fun movie on this list. But why is it number eight? It's so good. You guys should watch this movie. There's a couple, like, um, not plot holes, but, like, logic inconsistencies with it. that you No, just, uh, wrong. I don't agree. Next. Okay, keep going. Snowpiercer. For, so good for it this is the only uh one that's like english speaking korean movie um on the list but it's really it's really good and it's all a bottle kind of episode type situation where it's all on a train essentially i have to pee so i'll be right back all right. back from my bathroom break had a little too much tea okay <laughs> yeah so snowpiercer really good action movie i just thought the special effects were great and it was just uh i thought it was riveting from beginning to end I should also think that should be in the top three. Wow. Well, you've said four things should be in the top three, so your math <laughs> your math is a little off. Okay. All right. <laughs> math the, is not the best. The movie. host number six. I thought it was just a classic, great monster movie. So good. The acting is so good, especially the funeral scene. Best funeral scene I've ever. Yeah, best funeral oh, yeah, scene, yeah, hands was. down. You know, like in American movies, when someone dies, the crying. Never hits me. But in this movie, the screaming, the crying, because it's like I could relate to that. Like that's how I would imagine it would be more so than the, than just, just a, oh, I'm sad. And like, also, you just found out someone died. I'd be like, wow. <laughs> one of the two movies on this list about a quarantine and how we handle the quarantine. So it was, it was very prescient in my opinion. It was great. Um, number five, Mother. Oh, man. I thought this one... This one was good. It had a good twist as well. I felt like, yeah, the tw- uh, might be the number one twist for me of all the movies. Like, didn't see it coming, and I was trying to figure out the twist the whole movie. And it was just... It was great. The, um, the compassion I felt for the two main characters was really strong. And, um... Yeah, just a great mystery kind of a thriller. You kind of unwrap, you know, the whole story. And the way they present it was just uh, fabulous. So good. Okay. Number four, Train to Busan. Maybe the best zombie movie I've it's seen so good. since Zombieland. And so good. So the, It's funny, too. It's not – it is kind of funny. It's got perfect pacing, beginning to end, super riveting, and it just – uh, there's not a dull moment in the movie, and it has a satisfying ending. It's yes. Key. Satisfying ending. Super satisfying. All right. Number three, I ugh, I hated the ending to this movie, but I loved the 99% of it, The Wailing. Um, it's a it's – a, it's one of the best horror movies I've ever seen. Ugh, I, I felt like it could have gone up on the list if it didn't – Wait, are you serious? You put that as your number three? I was so upset at the ending, but I didn't want to punish it for having amazing, you Is know. this the one where the movie could have been done in five minutes had they had guns? 
it is funny because this is <laughs> this is a situation where if the cops had guns, it would be a five minute movie, but it's a hundred fifty minute movie. <laughs> you know, because uh, the cops didn't have guns. Great, great acting, and uh, yeah, like I said, it was actually a really riveting, gripping. Then the acting is really what makes it so good. I uh, the antagonists, I desperately wanted them to die. Spoiler alert, they don't. But I desperately wanted them to die, and I think that's why this movie was <laughs> so good. All right, my number two and my number one movies, I both think they're perfect 100 out of 100. So uh, we'll get to why one's better than the other. But number two, Parasite. Won the best picture uh, at the last Oscars. Completely deserved it. I totally disagree with it Trump on this one. It was such a great one. movie. It was a perfect movie. It's like a five-tool baseball player. It had everything you like about a movie. Amazing cinematography, amazing script writing. The acting was great. The settings are amazing. It was kind of it was a high budget, you know, had a lot of action. It was I fell asleep at the end of it though. Well, because it was late at night. Yeah, yeah. But it was So I missed the last 15 minutes. Absolutely but recommend fuck, it. I feel like the last 15 minutes were the minutes I needed to see. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. I just had Eric explain to me what happened. But it was <laughs> It, it, it was uh, it's one of the movies for the ages, but, you know, I have one movie that I put above it because it's just a higher difficulty movie to make. It was it, this movie was done for less than a tenth of the budget. I could have shot this movie. <laughs> it just required one old woman and a river and a farm. I mean, it was in an apartment. It was as high difficulty as possible to write something this good and have a movie this gripping without any budget. Poetry. The woman in this uh, in this movie, I'm I'm upset. I don't remember her name. It was it was a 2010 movie. She would have won the Oscar in 2011 if this was an American movie. It was the, the acting was incredible. The best performance on this list so far that I've seen out of a Korean movie. This was. It made Eric Unbelievable. cry. Unbelievable movie, and the writing was phenomenal. And I think the best movies are really understated. Like there were some, there were some moments where she got you just with a glance or just with a you know a very small subtle movement. It was really good. Okay, I I would. How would you reshape this list? Um, my number one would have been. Along with Gods, it's a re it's the most fun movie on the list. I, you got to check out so Along with good. the Gods. Okay, also because there's part one and part two, two and a half hour movie each. So super fun. Five hours of my life, totally worth it. And what I love about part one and part two, part two literally picks up right where part one ends. So it just continues. I loved that. It's my favorite part because you know how sometimes in like a part two of a series like it'll just be a whole different time frame it was like no not with this movie it was like we're right where the first one ended and we're gonna pick it up to the next part so good really loved it um that's why it would be my number one and then um out of poetry and parasite what did you think was the better movie to me that's the question i want to know parasite even though you fell asleep for the last 15 minutes. Yeah, Parasite was pretty cool. I don't know. I liked poetry, too. I I loved all the movies. But you have to understand, all of them, you have to watch and read subtitles at the same time. It's very difficult. Except Snowpiercer. Snowpiercer uh, is uh, the only English-speaking uh, one. I think what should happen is we need to have more Korean writers and movie directors in Hollywood so that... I can understand them. <laughs> I, or, or actually, okay, that's messed up. I think that we should, Hollywood just needs to start over. Just burn it down. You know what I mean? Burn it down, <laughs> start over. You know, I'm glad that Ellen's going to be gone. We should just have small talk. And um, <laughs> we should just start over with Hollywood because the movies suck. They suck so hard. You could every time you watch a Hollywood movie, it's like you know that there's some sort of weird agenda going on. It's like, what is this weird Illuminati thing they're trying to shove down our throats? You know what I'm talking about. Q, what's well, up? 
well, anyways, there's a lot of movies that you know the like certain governments pay like hey don't say this about us don't say this about us you know it's yeah so i what i really appreciate about watching this korean movie is it's just first of all i love that they're two hours long they're always two hours plus long which is just great because it's like i want to watch a movie i really want to be in the zone of this movie every american movie is like an hour and 20 minutes i'm like what kind of movie is that so lame but these korean movies they're always two hours plus the storyline is always something so different than i've seen i just feel like in hollywood we just keep doing these remakes these remakes 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 it's so annoying yeah, I would say the only derivative one is Along with the Gods, because it's a little bit like if Defending Your Life was an action movie, but still, it's still an original take on Defending Your Life, because Defending Your Life was more of a comedy. So I, it was real. Like I would recommend all these movies. You know, maybe not The Handmaiden, but from the witch. Not The Handmaiden, because that one just is weird. I mean, the only thing that's good about it is there's the one lesbian scene, but even that, eh. It was an interesting romantic uh, movie. It was better than a lot of romantic movies I've seen. But, eh, you know, The Witch, along with God, Snowpiercer, The Host, Mother, Train to Busan, The Wailing, Parasite, Poetry. All these movies are so much better than American movies I've seen in the past decade. Burn down Hollywood! Let's start over. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, well... Yeah, we are excited. Uh, we'll tell you if we uh, check out any more Korean movies we really love. Because that's like our new little Yeah, so thing. leave a comment. Let us know what movies you've been watching. If you've been watching any movies during this time. Um, yeah. yeah. This, this is has been another episode of the Comedy Cupcake. The longest one yet. With Lila. And Eric. Goodbye. See ya.